opening session. It's today's opening session for Women First, and I'm happy to be your moderator. We have with us very influential women, I should say, in their respective fields, and it's an honor to lead the conversation today. And I hope that in the one and quarter hour we have, we would be able to have meaningful conversations to explore the role women, the way women have occupied spaces, the way they are going to occupy spaces and the ways in which we can be healthy and more confident in the spaces that we occupy. So with me today, we have Nanama Dazi and Nanama is an award-winning background vocalist and she's a composer and she is the founder of Ghana Background Vocalist Association and she has been in many, many of the popular songs that we've heard and I would let her talk about that as we have the conversation. We also have Nina Okorafo, who is a social worker with the Department of Social Welfare at the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection in Ghana. She works with the Disabled People's Organization in various capacities, including representing young people with visual impairments on the board of Africa Union of Blind and World Blind Union Youth Committee. We also have Kukwa Mumfo, who is a trained architect and researcher, and she creates studies and documents architecture in Africa. And through her work with the Accra Archive Project, she's working to digitize endangered historical architectural material and building an archive of Ghanaian architecture. And lastly, we have Kirsty Kwating, who is a storyteller and curator of stories. She's the founder of the Nana Project, an online platform dedicated to preserving Ghana's history through first-hand accounts of Ghanaian elders. And I'm very privileged to be with you women today as we start off Woman Fest. And I'm happy to have you, uh, audience, too. As we go on, kindly type your questions in the chat, and we would be having the conversation with you as we continue. So to start off, I would like our guests to and they will throw the ball to each other. So after you have answered the question, <laughs> you call on another <laughs> of our panelists to answer the question. And then also, you could also ask questions to your panelists as we go on. So the first question is, how has your personal experience as a woman in the space you occupy now been for you? so far, like how has it been in the industry that you are in, in the field that you are in? And also how has the general occupancy of women in that space impacted your experience in that field? So I'll start off with Kirsty, and then you pass the ball to whomever you want to. Thank you, Nanaya, and thank you to the whole a Women Fest team uh, for putting this event on. It's really, it's, it's nice to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, to answer your question about how has it been for me personally in the space that I'm, that I occupy, um, I'm, I feel like I occupy, <laughs> I feel like we all occupy many spaces, you know? So there's the actual like physical space of the, the city that I'm in. Uh, right now I'm currently in, in London. And then there's the space of the because you want to say my occupation, I'm a PhD student right now, so you could say that my I'm I'm embedded in the academy right now, and then with my work with the Nana Project, um, I guess also being embedded in the digital history, digital humanities space, um, and in each in each of those spaces, I would say it's been I've having I've needed a lot of courage to kind of to be myself and be myself um, for forthrightly. I would say, especially in, in academia where it seems like anytime you get on Twitter, 
there's always some story about how some black woman was disrespected by her advisor or by her colleagues or you know by other people that that she's she's interacting with and i would have to say you know thankfully my experience um ha i haven't experienced a lot of those things but i'm aware that just because they haven't happened doesn't mean that they can't uh which is kind of a a, a stressful thing to to kind of carry with you but but i am you know grateful shout out to my advisor i'm grateful that my experience so far in the academy has has actually been very uh very welcoming and it and I think it's it's given me a lot of confidence in the work that I do which I'm actually looking at um children of Ghanaian immigrants and the way they maintain their connections to Ghana and I think as as we've seen your re return a lot of discussions around diaspora I think that work is very important so having the support of the people in the in the academy around me has been very important and I think the the work I do with the Nana project again um being a, a black woman in the digital humanity space i'm really encouraged to see that there are also a lot of black women working in these spaces i'd say kukwa is one anana Aforiata ayim is another one rita benison who runs Hene is another one there's i'd say you know sylvia arthur who runs the the library of african the african diaspora i would say is another one so i'm thankful that there are a lot of women that are doing the work and and i i argue or I feel that women generally like across cultures are the kind of the cultural, you know, the cultural cultural custodians of, of history. We're the ones that take care of it and maintain it and make sure that it's um preserved and and passed on. So it's also not surprising to me that as we are, are you know working to preserve our history in this digital age that it is a lot of women that are uh kind of car carrying that torch. Okay. So I'll I'll pass it on to Kukua. I knew it. <laughs> um, yeah, um, thanks for that. And thanks for the invitation. And it's nice to see everyone, including some familiar names. Um, yeah, shout out to everybody. Um, so with how personally um, I occupy space as a woman, um, the kind of like two dimensions. Um, one is how I try to, and then how, um, um, and to use a very technical kind of term is how people perceive me or specialize me inside, which is also interesting because um, my background is architecture. So there's also that like really physical dimension of, of space. And, and I like that um, Kirsty talked about the city, in this case, um, um, London. Um, so before I even went to architecture school, and, and these are things that I, I got to realize after with the benefit of like, reading and learning and, and, and hearing from other people um, is just um, this kind of way that our, our cities and our spaces and even our homes are structured, um, that it's, it's almost like you don't belong in a way that you don't really notice until you understand the kind of factors at play. Um, so um, I was recently um, working on, on this paper um, or this research project about um, the heights of shelves and counters in homes and how the kind of in Ghana the standard uh, anthropomorphic dimensions of these things are based on colonial standards which in turn are based on like proportions of a kind of idealized white man um, which is not standard because like even most white men are not that tall <laughs> um, then now to come and think of like black women and other people elsewhere and then um, just to briefly note about how I try um, how I try to to move and how to occupy spaces is I would just say in the word with intentionality. And so like that Kirsty talked about all the women in, in this space um, that um, like again, like I said, I knew Kirsty before, but discovered others through especially Instagram, which which was such a wonderful. Um, time. I think during the pandemic, especially, I think all of us tend to post in more than we usually did and, and found one another. Um, but this intentionality in like trying not to, to be a pace setter, you don't have to do, you can learn from other people, you should learn from other people, learn from other people's experiences, try to like hold someone's hand and walk on this journey with somebody. Um, so like in academia, which um, Kirsty and I in the same university, 
because this is being re recorded, I will not see certain things, <laughs> but it's good to, to grab on to um, like-hearted, I like that term, I saw it on Twitter once, and like-minded people, um, usually women, let's be frank, but not just women <laughs> all the time. Um, but yeah, just like being aware of your impact and how you move in the world and how other people perceive you and being intentional about who you are in community with and who you move through this world with. Um, I will pick Nina, but she's just next on my screen. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nina. Uh, so thanks for having me once again. I count this one of the a great pleasure, honestly, because on the subject matter, talking about moving through spaces, occupying spaces, my experience is more of a social one. Because for, um, to first note, I'm a person with visual impairments. And I've had to fit in this space from being a sighted person. I've had to navigate all the woes of, um, I'm trying to be very careful here, all the woes and wisdom of very well-meaning architects and creative people who consciously or unconsciously create barriers for me and people like, like me. Um, I am one who believes in the social model on disability that goes completely away from the medical model. So the medical model says the person is in charge of their disability. They are the reasons why they are disabled. And yes, that disability must be cured through medical means, right? But then the social model says, no, it's not the individual. Of course, I can't go to markets to buy blindness or disability for myself. It is the society that creates an open gutter, that writes a printed book that me as a blind person cannot access. If these things were all accessible, there will be no question of me being blind. So this is, I, this I, will, I would say is, um, one of the main premises on which I navigate through society. In places where I work and organizations I come into contact with, I am so aware of what is not accessible and what could be done to make it more accessible, not just for me, but even for the creator of that content, because just in case, just in case they lose what makes them being able, they still should be able to access what they have created. I'm sure it's gonna be very hard for um, someone who plays a musical instrument to all of a sudden lose the ability to hear. And how then does she or he interact with this content they have created. So basically, accessibility is one of my core points. Um, um, I, I don't know if it was mentioned, but I'm currently enrolled on a Master of Arts program at the University of Ghana. And my project work is on disability and diversity. How persons with disability are viewed in the workspace, both as workers and as customers of FinTech products. And you realize that it's all about occupying one space, mainly as a person with disability. So I'm really glad to be here. And again, I'm particularly glad that this topic is centered on women because women first are not so on the top, and then women with disabilities. Oh my, so way down below. It's quite a challenge. Maybe as time goes on, we'll be able to explore more. But thanks once again, Madam Liz. 
and thanks to you all panelists. I think this is a real creative panel. I see architects, I see musicians, I see writers are uh, so creative and academics, yes. I love academics too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. And thank you all for your response. And carrying on from Nina's angle to the question I asked, I want us to explore the question of women's access to spaces and our interactions with the barriers that have been put up consciously or unconsciously, deliberately or inadvertently to women having access to economic spaces, to social spaces, to physical spaces, to all the aspects of human existence that we ought to participate fully in, but which we do not have the access to do so. And I will start off with Kukwa on this. Yeah, um, thanks for that. And yeah, thanks Nina for those really great points. And yeah, like um, as the, I think the only representative of the architectural community here, uh, yes, I will take all that um, the, the, the premise of design and what the kind of standards of design are, are really in a word ridiculous. Um, so even with in Ghana, even though we have sort of best practices, standards and everything, you, you still find it difficult to convince clients, but even sometimes architects um, to design to accommodate disabilities in, in, in these things. So things that in my opinion are quite basic, like even ramp access to space, um, not even talking about the kind of technological additions, but just things to, to guide uh, uh, and people with disabilities. And, and then uh, recently, um, I didn't know, so I, I, I live in the UK now because I'm studying at, at the university. Um, and I recently found out because someone um, told me, someone who um, uses um, a cane, um, told me that the streets, um, a lot of the streets here have um, kind of tactile, I forget the technical term, but they have kind of tactile bumps and things so that when you're moving with the cane, with the, the wheel picks up different parts, patterns and rhythms to let you know, okay, you're approaching the traffic lights, um, you are approaching the turn. And I didn't know, I used to see them, I just thought they were like patterns and decorations on it. And I, I remember how amazed I was and also how it made sense, how it was easy for people and even Asian people to move on their own. Um, my friend Anama always says that we don't have old people in Ghana, which I, I know Kesti, <laughs> Kesti's like, oh yeah, like this is another project. But it's true, we don't see them out, like walking in a way that here, like, like literally today on my way back from school, I saw this really old, completely white-haired woman, almost bent over, hunched over with her little trolley, shopping on the way home because she can. Um, there's sidewalks wide for her to go, um, traffic lights work, she hits it, they stop. Um, it's not like Ghana that someone asked me for a zebra when I was angry that they didn't stop at the zebra crossing for me to cross. Um, and it's just a way that, and, and it's, not, it's not even great here. So it's just a way that people who design physical space and design um, um, sort of norms and laws on how we move through physical space can take into consideration or consideration all the different kinds of people who use space and live in space. And another ridiculous thing about these standards on like sort of this particular height and physical stature of one man is that it's really, they make it seem like it's an average, but it's really not, it's actually an exception. So that's actually designing for a very small niche percentage of the population and it's not representative at all. If you were actually trying to find the average human being, and, and there was an article about this reason, like the height was about five seven, um, whereas um, um, for those who are not aware, like these architectural standards, like are like for six six foot people, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So if they were actually trying to design for the average person. Um, Recently, the, so yeah, I read a lot of these things about the perfect things, but even the average dress size apparently for like a bride is like a US size 14, which 
again, if you follow the fashion magazines and stuff, that's not what is presented to us. So if you're actually trying to find a mean, an average, then there'll be a totally different thing. But we don't even need to find that. Like if we design for the people with the most need, other people can navigate it as well. And that's, it doesn't take much apart from a shift of mindset. It's not, in this law of research, it's not actually more expensive, actually not more time intensive. It's just requiring a shift of personal priorities, but also social priorities, like what we care about and who we care about and who we think are important in society. Kirsty. So can you please repeat the question? So I was asking about accessibility and the ways in which barriers have been put up consciously or unconsciously, deliberately or not that prevents women from accessing certain things in society, whether economic, whether social, whether physical, like all sorts of spaces that women should have access to. I was asking if, like what you thought about those barriers. Okay, so the first thing, I guess, you know, like my like Kukla said, I, I, I tend to focus on the stories of our elders because of the work of the Nana Project. And so the first thing I thought of was my grandmother uh, who was born in 1911. Uh, she, I think she was, well, I think she had eight, eight, I think she was one of eight, the second of eight. And, and I think there were four boys and four girls and none of the girls were educated uh, because her father didn't see the point in educating his girl children. So while my grandmother's brothers went and had really you know, great jobs and careers, um, my grandmother and her siblings uh, and they they worked in the market, which is you know not you know not knocking market women at all. They are most definitely the backbone of Ghanaian society. Um, but just compared with what they were able to achieve compared to their brothers, like for them, they were denied ac deliberately denied access uh, to education um, by their father. And so, and you know, in addition to you know working you know, in the market, they also had to to marry well. Um, which, you know, they were also able to do because um, they, you know, they had to, they needed someone that could uh, provide for, you know, provide for them and their children. And so um, while my grandmother and her sisters were not educated, they married men uh, who were educated. And I think uh, with that, um, my grandma and my, and my, my grandmother and my mom's oldest sister, when my mom was born, really did what they could to make sure that my mother was able to get a, a solid education um, and be able to, because with, with education, uh, you're, it gives you access to a lot of different spaces and places. It also, I would say in the Ghanaian context, gives you access to uh, learning English, uh, which, which if you don't go to, you know, if you don't, if you don't have the opportunity to receive a, uh, education, or even if you're educated up to a certain point, you might not be able to speak English. And that will also limit the type of spaces that you can go in, or maybe spaces that you uh, feel comfortable going in. And so I think thinking about my, you know, life, you know, my trajectory, having a grandmother that didn't have school for my mother being able to get educated and for my sister and I to also now um, uh, be, you know, get an education and be access to space in different spaces, um, political spaces, social spaces um, that we've been able to get simply because we had the opportunity to 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 go to school is um, is 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 mind blowing. So I think when we think about uh, access, you know, access to spaces, you know, there's there's a lot of different factors, but I would say education for women and for for girls is is a is a big one. Okay. Thank you very much. And the audience, you can begin to ask your questions in the chat and we would incorporate them in the conversation we are having because you are part of the conversation. So do put your questions in the chat and we will ask them as we go on. And I'm very happy that you mentioned education as the major either door which could be either a barrier or an access point 
to get into certain spaces in society. One thing I would also like to ask following from that is the, so this grieves me, the idea of affirmative action and the many tentacles of it. <laughs> and there've been, there've been comments around that sometimes affirmative action is just to appease a certain excluded group to make people satisfied and keep quiet. I would want to pick your brain on what you think about um, women getting access to certain places in these contemporary times and whether the inclusion we have is just to have a gender balance or it's truly from a place of um, influencing perspectives, influencing um, the ways in which we understand and work around things. I think I will start with Nina on this. Nina, what do you think about gender inclusion being a forefront of things, like maybe hiring or giving opportunities to people, scholarships, things like that? Okay, so I'll give you a very, very basic example, very real life experience of mine. So for me, any affirmative action will not just be because I'm a woman, but also because I'm a person with disability, right? So I see this job opening, it's a technology job. Um, oh, of course, being visually impaired, I'm still very tech, Savvy. Yeah, sort of. So I applied to this tech job and I go through all the examination. So many, almost 300 people applied. And I made it through, through the exams, through the interviews and everything. And my bosses are excited. Yeah, we are getting a woman and she's a person with disability. We need her on board. But guess what? They didn't just need me on board because I made all the grades and I passed all the exams. They needed me on board because they, they were going to use me as a statement to get more funding for themselves. As in to make a statement that we are a company that have employed a woman with disability to work with us. And so just because of that, this should give them extra funding. From that point of view, they are thinking it's affirmative action. We've given a woman with disability a job. From my point of view, I'm thinking, I wrote the exam everyone else was meant to write. And by grace, by intellect, by whatever anyone wants to call it, I made it in. I wasn't given the job just because I was blind, because of course, there were so many other blind people who wrote that same exam. How come they didn't get through? Long and short of the whole thing is, yes, affirmative action does help at a point, but I don't think it should be a blanket statement. Because then, when you follow affirmative action, you're actually inadvertently calling for reverse discrimination. You are chastising a company for not employing women, right? Okay, the company says, fine, we'll employ women, but then we make them clean it. Do you then say they're doing the right thing or they're doing the wrong thing? And so affirmative action, yes, but it should be guarded. One very um, nice way of guarding affirmative action I will use is the University of Ghana's affirmative action um, sort of policy for admitting persons with disabilities into the school. So I don't know if we, we all know, but there already is an affirmative action for girls in the University of Ghana. Um, a program, a boy who has to get grade eight to, to enter, a girl could enter with grade 10. I really don't know what thinking goes into it, but I would like to zero in on the affirmative action for persons with disabilities. So persons with disabilities are not able to do math or science here in Ghana 
because teachers at the senior high school level cannot teach persons with visual impairment math or science. Therefore, persons with visual impairment can enter the University of Ghana without math or science. It is through no fault of ours, but the University of Ghana understands and accepts that and gives us the admission to enter the university. Someone will think, why give them this admission? They didn't do math and science. Anyone else who comes in without math and science will not be admitted. Therefore, don't admit persons with visual impairment. But the University of Ghana and all the management that went into coming up with such an affirmative action policy thought about all the good connotations that came with it. So that's what I would say. Affirmative action, yes, but should be used guardedly. Okay, Kesti, what do you have to say about this affirmative action and the risk of tokenization that it brings? Yeah, this is, uh, it's always a, an, an interesting uh, thing to think about. Um, and I guess in regards to, to, to gen well, not even just gender, I guess I know in, the, in the, the US, UK, they talk about affirmative action, I would say more from a, a racial uh, perspective. Um, and I think, I think it's necessary. Uh, yeah, I think it's necessary just because, I mean, historically, um, gender-wise women and I guess racially um, black people and other people of color have been um, denied access to, you know, things like education, um, access to good jobs and things of that nature. And so because of that, there is a, 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 a parity in, and who is at the top and like if you go to any any organization when you look at the CEOs and the people at the top chances are they all look a, a certain way then the lower you go the people are also looking a certain way and so unless people just you know want to it would be great if we lived in a world where affirmative action wasn't needed because people would see just like, oh, this person, they have the skills that we need, et cetera, et cetera. Like, let's, let's bring them on. Um, but we're seeing, I've been reading a lot about this and there seems like, or what is the literature saying? That people in higher positions want to be around people that look like them or people that are from backgrounds that they are also from uh, because it just makes their life easier. And so that's part of the reason why uh, we, we are, it's part of the reason why there's such a, a such a difference in what people look like at the top and what people look like that, that are not at the top. So until I guess people have a you know have a change of heart and decide to make those uh, those hiring decisions differently on their own volition, we'll need things like affirmative action. But I would say you know there's also like a saying that's popular now that um, representation matters, and I think it does matter, but up to a point because just because someone you know looks a certain way doesn't mean that they will necessarily make um, decisions that benefit people that also look like them if that makes any sense yeah thank you very much so talking about people occupying the high position to reminds me of um, Dr. Ngozi Wieles' appointment as WTO boss earlier this year, I think it was March this year. And it sparked a conversation between me and a few friends about the burden of representation. And I want to know how, whether you have felt the burden of representation as a woman in the space you occupy, and if you have, how you have navigated that or continue to navigate that. I think Kukua. Yeah, I, I just saw we had like a really, a comment that like, just like relates to something I want to say about the affirmative action um, thing mm -hmm. in the University of Ghana and elsewhere. Like I, I get the fears about, about um, unqualified or not appropriately qualified people getting into positions just because um, they take certain protected characteristics um, boxes, but the evidence shows that we are actually really far away from that. Um, like take, 
take your people on this panel, take Kirsty and take Nina, for example, right? Before they even get to the point where they're applying for these sorts of things with other people. Uh, and uh, let me use Kirsty because at least I know I don't see anyone from SOAS in the call. <laughs> Like Kessie's applying for the PhD at SOAS. Um, the average white person who's applying for the same PhD at SOAS is like, okay, they finished their undergrad, they did some masters and okay, yeah, they, they, they are really passionate about this topic and they are coming. Kessie has to like speak at TEDx, start a foundation, like start a whole trend of recording oral histories. Like she has to do stuff that professors as so as having that before she's even on that kind of playing field to even be assessed with these people. So of course people will say, oh yes, they're trying to get like enough black women, but think of the black women they even get to pick from. These people are like heads and shoulders above what they think are the standard candidates. And it's, it's the same in other places. Like it's a thing that we miss in thinking of who even gets to that point to cross that line. And this goes with the request points. Like I get absolutely what your, your friend is. And, and I do agree. I, I feel like, um, I don't know about data for Ghana, so I can't speak to Ghana, but um, in South Africa, for instance, there's also research about who actually benefits. And also in America, I'm sure I can see your question, who actually benefits from affirmative action policies. Usually it's really upper class, middle to upper class black people, um, white women who are in these protected characteristics but don't suffer the full brunt as other people. So, so I, I, I do agree that in some cases it puts people at a disadvantage, but the, the, the solution is not to cancel affirmative action, is to make it targeted to account for the different ways in which different people are inconvenienced and disenfranchised and discriminated against in society. And to understand that like, the, the thing of, um, um, what's her name, intersectionality, Crenshaw's intersectionality, like um, the laws, the constitution affects us differently because of our positionalities and we occupy certain stranding or intersecting categories. So it's not that in, um, affirmative action is like, it's putting token, like it's, it's leading tokenism or stuff. It can, but we are so far away from there. Because if we now start like examining who are already in those positions, who are already like, in the top echelons of businesses and academia, if we now start to look where they come from and compare them to the so-called tokens, it won't be funny. And yeah, it's going to look really funny in the light. Um, yeah, sorry to go off on that, but I, the data doesn't bear it out basically. Okay, okay. Yeah. So just briefly on the burden of representation again. <laughs> just uh, as, as a woman in the space you are, are you required to represent the collective in one way or the other? Do people see you as the yardstick for the identity you bear as a woman in the space you are, in your job, in your, yeah. Yeah, so women definitely, but also um, because of, again, being in the UK, there's also the racial element as well. And then there's also like the, because like I'm also, because there's black British people here, I'm coming from Ghana. There's also the, the kind of you're representing the Africans, right? Um, so there's the way that people um, who are not from the places where you are, don't occupy the same kind of categories to look at you and hold you out as representing. Sometimes in, like mostly is not in a good way, in that way, but there's another dimension to it, which I don't mind. Like I, I like is is people from the same places or similar places identifying with you and like trying to be in community with you. Um, I personally, like, I can see how it can be a burden, and and it can be because I'm not in like I'm not the head of the WTO, so I don't know that's that wahala, but I don't really see it so much as a burden like I I know I do not represent all my like even in my own house I don't represent my family and my household and if anyone who knew them would be, would, be, would think it's ridiculous to think I represent. so I know and I'm kind of confident and secure that my actions don't represent a whole community that I I come from even though people see it that way and I try not to yeah I, I don't really I used to care right now I don't care anymore but also I like that other Ghanaians like reach out to me when they come 
yeah, other black women, other like Africans, like, yeah. So I don't really see that, but I, I completely accept it because I'm not in positions of like great responsibility over so many people where all eyes are watching for me to make the least mistake, which like would be terrifying as we've seen with like, uh, like the Olympics with Simon Biles who I, I teared a little watching, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kukua. And your answer has really struck a chord with people. Malfoa says, as a woman in African living in China, there's been pressure to go the extra mile to change the stereotypical narratives on Africans in Asia. Girl, <laughs> I wish I could give you a hug right now. <laughs> but um, thank you, Kukua. Um, Nina, could you speak on this and then we'll move to Liz, who is in the background of things, making sure everything is working well. She has a question. So Nina, just speak on whether, well, I suppose there will be, but how has it been for you? How do you deal with it? And does it impact your individuality in the space you occupy? It does. It does sometimes. Um... Because I bet most of you have not um, met or interacted with someone you know is visually impaired on such a level. And so I'm sure most of you are, are even thinking, no, she's not blind. No, how could she be talking so well? No, she's not blind. She can't be blind. But I'll then ask, did I say I was mute? I just said I was blind. My mouth can talk. Anyway. So because I am who I am and I come into contact with, say, Kukwa for the first time, Kukwa now puts me in her mind and says, I know this wonderful blind lady. So I'm expecting every other blind person to be as Nina or better. Now Kukwa goes further to hit on someone who is not like Nina. Why can't you use a computer? Why can't you be self-independent? Why can't you be, why, why aren't you able to do A, B, C, or D? Without thinking of the other aspect, sorry, Kuka, for using your name in this one. <laughs> <laughs> Without actually, you know, um, analyzing the situation on the ground. In Ghana, we always say, five fingers are not the same. So you can't use me to represent the entire body of women with disability or women with, with visual impairment. It can really sometimes get to me. Of course, some, it has its high parts. I like it when people are like, oh, she's amazing. I've never met any other blind person like her. It's nice. But then it puts pressure on me to do more because I know I can't be here forever. More people behind me are coming and they will overtake me. So I should go on. I shouldn't just stay here. So it could be burdensome, but it has its high points too. Thank you very much, Nina. So Liz, we are ready to hear your question. Yes, hi, it's been great so far. We've really had a lot of great insights from our panelists, Kukwa, Kesti, and of course, Nina. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to Nina for joining us. And one of the main goals um, for this panel was to get as a diverse group as possible. And um, Nina does make that possible. So a special thank you to Nina. Um, my question really is um, taking us away from the academic um, side of things. But I really, um, there was a tweet that I saw a few weeks ago that Kukwa put out and it was about the fact that many women in Ghana actually owned land um, in the 40s and 30s. But I think there was something, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there was something about them not actually owning the land because they had to register the land in their husband's names or whoever the man in their lives was. So it really got me thinking about how, you know, in our history, we really don't have a lot of women being highlighted. That doesn't mean that they were not there. However, I really want us to come down to the everyday Ghanaian woman. And let's um, talk about why, first of all, we think that these everyday women, so let's take the market women, the hairdresser, the 
woman who sells wachi who is struggling to get her kids to school have been removed from our history and the history has been sort of very either um, men dominated or even if they are women these are women who are, have been privileged one way or the other so my question is um, as people who are working in different spaces what are your thoughts when you interact with everyday women and how their stories have been sidelined and, and, and removed from history and following up with that how we can work more to include them in the history that we are making today and that will be read in a few years to come and what can we do to include them and make history a bit more diverse so maybe i would like to maybe i, should, I would like nina to start answering so i'm going off Thank you for showing your face to us, Liz. So Nina. Hi. So how do we include women in the narrative of social, economic, land ownership? And yeah, um, I may be a bit biased on this topic because I grew up in a, in a, a family of very strong women. In fact, there is this joke that um, most of the men die and leave the women. Like the women are very strong, stronger than the men, of course. And so I, I grew up not knowing that women were not included because in my home, there was no issue of women did A and boys did B. No, everybody did what needed to be done only to grow up, become blind, and start working in a male-dominated space and all that. And then I, I, I start, I mean, I was so angry when I heard that women can't own their own land. I was like, that should not be possible. Where are the laws? Where is all that? But I think that apart from calling on everybody to include us, we as women should work extra harder. Yes, it can be burdensome. Yes, I know. But we hold it in our own hands to make us our own voices heard where we want them to be heard. We shouldn't ask everybody to hold our hand and put us up there. I always said that I will not vote for a woman president or MP or whoever just because she was a woman. No, I will vote for her because she had proven to be capable of doing it or is campaigning on a very level playing ground as the men will come and say, I will do A, B, C, and D. So she should also come and say, she will do A, B, C, or D. And that is the basis on which I will vote for her. Another thing I'd like to talk about is the issue of mentorship. It will surprise you, but on this affirmative action bill, I attended a program a few weeks or months ago and there were top feminist women's activists talking and we need the affirmative action bill and everything, heaven and earth. Now, one of the top women on that panel was being accused of not mentoring younger ones because the younger ones will definitely come and take her space. So um, the call was for older feminists to mentor younger feminists. And she made a very, a, a comment I'll call funny. She said, I don't need to hold your hands. I need you to hold on to my skirt. I was scandalized. Do I need to hold on to your skirt to learn what you are teaching the whole world? But you are, you are teaching the whole world to ban patriarchy, right? And yet you are, you are operating on the same principle that, well, I am up here, you are way down there. You need to learn from me, you need to tag on my skin. You need to um, uh, be part of the servitude parameters to be able to learn from what I'm doing. I, I think that women should be more active in mentoring one another and should be more proactive in claiming the spaces they want own the space you want it will not just come to you that's that's what i learned growing up as a girl and that's what i've come to th that's what has helped me survive as a blind girl thank you 
Thank you very much, Nina. Let's hear Kirsty on this. I think Nina made a very excellent point of and that comment about the this the this holding on to the skirt is wow I I don't even know what to say say to that but I think it goes back to the point I made earlier about you know repre representation matters but up to a point because if you get into you know the these as a woman if you get into these spaces that are you know very limited to women and you don't want to also help other women get into those same spaces is kind of like what is what is the point point? and so I know um being throughout my PhD I've had the privilege of teaching and I've had a lot of um the black female students that I've taught you know come up to me after and you know ask questions about pursuing PhDs and I you know I know because they've seen me and they've seen me, you know, I teach, you know, in this London, there's, but there's plenty of black people. I come in my head wraps. I come like, I come how I am. I come, I have natural hair. I wear my hair out because that's just who I am. And I think in them, them seeing me be myself in these spaces where women, dark skinned black women, women with natural hair are not always viewed positively. It, um, it gives them courage like, oh, I can come as myself in these spaces and still be successful. So I, I agree with Nina. I think it's important, it's important to mentor um, you know, younger, younger generations of women that are doing things in the, the field that you're in. But, um, but to get to the question of um, histories and, and how to include uh, um, the, the, the stories of everyday women, um, and why they're not, you know, always considered like you know, the the market women, the washi sellers. I go, honestly, my first my first um, thought was capitalism uh, as being a reason why that uh, the stories of everyday women are not included because we we value um, people with power, and the stories of people of, of of that are in powerful positions, the stories of people that have money, and we kind of view the the stories of those, you know, the the everyday people um, as not being as important because we don't view the, the watchy seller or you know the the mechanic or whoever you know the everyday people in our communities as as have being of worth or having um, as much importance as like these like big big name people but I don't you know I don't believe that and I think that's one thing uh, we've tried to do with uh, the Nana Project. So I, I, I founded the Nana Project, but it's myself and two other women um, that um, that that are are that are running it. And so we, you know, we do our best to try to speak to people that are just or, or ordinary Ghanaians finding out about uh, the things that they re they remembered uh, from different parts of Ghana's history. And even before that, uh, before I started the Nana Project, I would just talk to the people in my family about the things that uh, they remembered from in different parts of Ghana's history. So talking with, you know, my aunts and uncles, my parents, older, even older cousins uh, that I have that can remember when my parents started dating or can remember what my mom was like in high school. You know, I think these, these are things that um, we have access to so much history and to so much knowledge about our nation and, and about our families. We just have to kind of change the lens of like who we view as as being like who whose story enough is 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 interesting. Like who like who you know we we have we have access to a lot. We just really need to view the the everyday people around us as being important and, and being you know worthy enough of like having their their lives in, interrogated. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Kukua, let's hear your thoughts on this. Um, yeah, so this is a thing that I, I grapple with a lot in the kind of his, history and memory work that I do. And I'd like to you to uh, you, Kirsty, to comment on this as well after I'm done. But before, I would like to say, because it will not be me if I if I don't say that I think that the reports of women not supporting each other are greatly exaggerated. I think it's really, it's a human thing. And just as you meet, I don't know if I can use assholes, but you meet assholes across all genders. Um, it's not gender specific. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, it, it, and this used to happen to me. I used to feel it more keenly 
if I met another black woman architect and they didn't instantly come like, come, 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 come under my arm. But it's not fair to hold it against them. Maybe, maybe they don't, they don't like it. So it's fine. <laughs> um, but um, with the thing about um, including ordinary women in the narrative, um, so like this is this is kind of like my starting point for when I'm doing memory and history work. But it's difficult because um, again, by virtue of who's recording some of this historical stuff, and then in here, yeah, I know we are trying to move away from academia, but like these are the kind of <laughs> foundational text and, and narratives. So I'm talking like the kind of formalistic things, things that are written down, even oral narratives is, is like what we privilege and um, the kind of stories, again, like Kessie said, the, cap the capitalist who has money, who has power kind of thing. All of them kind of combine to, to make us record mostly men, but also then elite women um, as well in, in these, um, archives, histories, everything. Um, so it's usually difficult to trace the lives of ordinary. And then also like what is even ordinary in, in a way, because again, if you trace some of these like women that we don't hear of. So I'll even say that even like the elite women, the famous women, apart from the usual like Yas Antoine and, and cool, even them, they are not um, recorded enough. They are not even, celebrated enough, even them, the powerful, the, the, the daughters of kings and, and stuff like that, yeah, even them. So it, it's, it's difficult to, and it's also, I think it's, and I don't know what you think about this, but I think it requires a restructuring of the way we think of what we record and what we, we um, yeah, what we, we, we privilege in this recording. So, would it be possible to write a story of the founding of Ghana that did not mention JB Dankwa or Nkrumah or the big six or big 10, whatever? Would it be possible? Like, could you write a people's history of the founding of Ghana based on like who should, because imagine when they, they send them to, to jail that nobody came out, nobody stood there clamoring for their release. Nobody protested, nobody went. If it was only the six of them on the streets every day, we won't be where we are now, right? So I, and I, and to, I, I understand it's difficult because again, there's always like the people in the leadership positions, there's this kind of hero narrative we love. That's why we like superhero movies. So I know it's difficult, but yeah, let, let, me, let me pass on to Nina and Kirsty, what you think about writing the granular ground level history of things, of ordinary people. So I, I think that they've had a go at this question. And in the comments, Kina has, I think you addressed um, Ereko's statement about women not supporting each other. And Kina has also responded and she says, there is a lot that goes unacknowledged with this women not supporting each other issue. So much we miss seeing because we tend to look for support as defined by more formal terms, as defined by whiteness and its culture. I don't know of any Ghanaian woman who is without support from other women. And I agree with this. And one thing I would also like to add is that society has been built on the ideas of the feminine and the masculine. And this has been facilitated by patriarchy. So there are certain traits which we identify as masculine traits, and there are certain traits, behaviors and attitudes which we identify as feminine traits. Competitiveness is an, is, a, is an attitude that we ascribe to as masculinity which is why you would find people using very derogative terms for women athletes, even for instance, trying to denigrate their competitiveness in words like beastly, in words like they are, she looks like a man or she, she's like that sort of, to ask to strip their femininity because of their competitiveness. A woman is expected to be more nurturing rather than competitive. So in a situation where there is a woman 
occupying a certain space and she's exuding competitiveness, even if it is to somebody who is more junior. Competition is not always lateral. Sometimes it's vertical. So in a space where she's exuding competitiveness, it may appear as if she's not being supported, but you can be competitive and be supportive at the same time. But we have not been trained to have that kind of perspective when looking at the way women navigate certain spaces and express certain behaviors and express certain attitudes. So that's just one thing I would like to add to that issue of women not supporting each other. We will be rounding up in nine minutes. And it's been a very interesting conversation. I wish we had a lot more time, but I, <laughs> I know we all have a lot of things to get back to doing. But one last question, and I want us to use this this question should be more celebratory. Who are the women occupying spaces in Ghana or other parts of the world that make you happy just when you think about them? What are they doing that makes you excited about them in the spaces that they are occupying? It could be yourself. Don't be, <laughs> don't be modest and leave yourself out. But this last session, let's make it celebratory and think about women occupying certain spaces. What are they doing that you would want people in the panel to get to know about, that you would want the rest of us to know about? And yeah, let's celebrate women occupying spaces. Let's start with, I don't know who to start with. Who would like to start? Okay, cool, cool. Since you are still on my screen, please go ahead. Okay. I, um, yeah, so I, again, like I occupy multiple spaces. So I think I've already plugged um, Kirsty and then I'm not project enough. <laughs> and we, we know everybody. I think um, Paulina or Pauline is um, old to high life, who will be here soon. We've mentioned um, Rita of Sihene. Um, so if you just go to the Accra Archive website, I have like a page on like people doing this kind of stuff. So you can see like a full list of stuff there. Um, but yeah, like for me, I'm, I'm, like Nina said, me, I'm completely surrounded by, and Kina also mentioned, like me, I'm completely surrounded by um, supportive women to the extent that like when people ask me to recommend people for things, like usually my first three are, a woman um, in architecture, like people who are trying to do sort of documenting, recording work, it's it's usually women um, for me as well. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I fully celebrate. She mentioned these accounts. There's a lot more on my website um, um, in architecture as well. Um, yeah, listed everywhere. And shout out to Kina because Kina is the love of my life. <laughs> Thank you very much, and yay to Kina. Nina, let's hear you. Who are occupying space? Which women are occupying spaces that you would like to celebrate, and including yourself? What would you like us to celebrate about you? Ah, uh, I <laughs> okay. So I I like to celebrate all the lecturers, the female lecturers who taught me in the university. They inspired me. I never wanted to be a teacher in my life. I, I, I completely despised the teaching profession. But I, by watching them and by um, benefiting from the knowledge they gave me, it inspired me so much to want to go into academia, for which reason I am here today. And yeah, by God's grace, I'll keep climbing the ladder. Shout to one very big shout to shout is to Madam Angela. Her name is Angela Asaria Fran. She taught me math in JHS and she still mentors me today. She's so amazing. She has so much passion for whatever she does and she does it with so much style. Yes, shout to Madam Angela, wherever she is. And to my mom and grandmother, the two strongest women I've ever known. So strong to raise families. <laughs> Hello, Angela. 
So shout to my mom and my grandma who have done it with and all without the men in their lives, inspiring me to keep being the woman, being my own woman, and to chase the dreams that I always want to. So shout to all of them. And shout to all of you here. You're so amazing. Keep going. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, let's hear from you, Kirsty. Uh, so um, my friend, Ama Abwaji, she is in Ghana. Uh, she wears many hats, <laughs> um, but she's very, she has um, an organization called the Afro Pole. And it's all about connecting uh, the African continent with the entire African diaspora, not like when we talk about diaspora, we think of, you know, like Europe and North America, but she also is including the Caribbean, uh, South America, um, pretty much anywhere where um, Black people are, she's looking for ways to, um, to highlight the connections between Black people all over the world. Uh, she put on a, a big festival in 2019 called the Wax Print Festival, which is really just a celebration of um, African fabrics and also a discussion, had lots of discussions around the history of, of uh, wax print uh, fabrics. So she's a, a champion of uh, African arts and culture and, and Afro diaspora and, uh, arts and culture as well. So I would say uh, check her out or check out, I think they have the website, Af Afropole dot com most likely um and then i my grandmother i mean she's no not longer with us unfortunately but she's a Ghanaian woman that continues to inspire me um every day she passed away in 2007 and i started the nana project um not directly after she passed but her passing was kind of the the impetus that that's that that gave me the the drive to to start it and so um, yeah, so, so, you know, shout out to her, but also to all the, the Ghanaian women elders that are, that have, you know, raised us, that have take, taken care of us, that have really done their best to, to support us. And I, every day I wish them, I wish I had had more time with my grandmother, um, before she passed. I feel like I didn't get enough time because I have so many questions about her and her life and the, the things that she experienced, um, that I'm, I'm now trying to do my best to capture um, in the stories of, of other people's grandmothers. So um, I just, you know, shout out to, yeah, shout out to our, um, our female elders. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our panelists and to everybody that has come. I'm going to turn over the screen to Liz to round it up for us. Yes, thank you so much, Nanaya, for being an amazing moderator. The questions that you brought up were really good. And thank you to our panelists, Kirsty Fanting, Kukwa Manfo, and Nina Okorafo. You guys have been so great. And um, it's been a privilege to put this together and have you make the time for us. And to everyone that joined us um, tonight, I hope that this discussion has spark something interesting for you that you would you know spread out to the world to get people to talk more about and um, a lot of good points were made the session has been recorded and so we will make it available after the whole festival after some editing has been done and um, i just want to announce that tomorrow same time at 7 pm we have another panel discussion and it is reporting women in Ghanaian news and this features again women in the media who are reporters on both um, English speaking and media platforms and the Ghanaian language speaking platforms. We also have a lawyer joining us and so it promises to be an amazing panel discussion. So join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. and please follow the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora on social media at Lothar underscore org on Twitter and on Instagram and follow the Woman First page, Woman First GH on Instagram for updates on our events. So thank you once again, enjoy your evening and please spread the word about Woman First if you enjoyed this session that people should join. We've had a great number turnout for the first event and we hope to keep this growing until Saturday the 7th. So bye everyone and thank you for joining. Bye. Bye.